Zombie Science, Part 6. We've been going through the book Zombie Science, More Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells, um, who wrote it as a sequel to his book in 2000, uh, Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. And um, the cover of the book looks like that. You notice the now familiar series, Ape to Man, only the last one is zombie. Um, and uh, uh, Jonathan, I can say Dr. Dr. Wells, actually, because he has two earned doctorates, believe it or not, um, gives introductory remarks, including about science, evolution, and trusting scientists, which is probably important when you get started. You have to kind of lay the groundwork. The Tree of Life and homology are two of the icons of evolution that have become part of zombie science. And then he covers the other eight uh, uh, um, icons that he discussed in the first book, Survival of the Fakest, uh, discussing the Miller-Urey apparatus, Haeckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, Peppered moths, Darwin's finches, four-winged fruit flies, the horse series, and the ch chimp human series, noticing that they all make their appearances in textbooks uh, discussed, I think you could call it fairly uncritically. Um, and then he introduces a new one, which is DNA, the secret of life. Now, DNA has a lot of specificity and says a lot of things, but it is not enough to specify an organism alone, and he goes into epigenetics and positional information and so forth, uh, <coughs> which complicates the effort to try to evolve anything. Then he talks about walking whales, the whale evolution series, which has taken the place of the horse series, has the problem of missing the most important intermediates, the ones that go from water to air, and, or from air to water, and of not enough time. Uh, the human appendix and other so-called junk, the arguments over vestigial organs and junk DNA fail both because they're not useless and because uselessness would not prove the point the arguers are trying to make. And now we come to the human eye. We begin with um, Darwin's theory. The human eye, once thought to be a major stumbling block for Darwin's theory, has now become an icon of evolution. But it serves as an icon in two very different ways. First, defenders of evolution argue that eyes can evolve very easily. Second, alleged flaws in the human eye are used as evidence for unguided evolution and against intelligent design. In The Origin of Species, Darwin included a chapter titled Difficulties on Theory. And in one of his sections, he discussed organs of extreme perfection and complication. Chief among these is the eye. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest possible degree. Shades of Dawkins' um, uh, biology is the study of extremely complicated objects that give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. Yet, Darwin immediately suggested a way to overcome the difficulty. In fact, I suspect that if he hadn't had this in his pocket, he wouldn't have brought up the eye to begin with. If numerous gradations from a perfect and complex eye to one very imperfect and simple, each grade being used uh, useful to its possessor, can be shown to exist, if further the eye does, not, does vary ever so slightly and the variations be inherited, which is certainly the case, and if any variation or modification in the organ be ever useful to an animal under changing conditions of life, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection, though insuperable by our imagination, can hardly be considered real. You just think. 
it's impossible. Numerous gradations. Modern animals do indeed have eyes that range from relatively simple to very complex. Flatworms have eye spots that consist of a single layer of photosensitive cells. Jellyfish also have simple eye spots, though box jellyfish have additional eyes that are more complex. The giant clam and the chambered nautilus have pinhole eyes with light sensing cells inside a deep pit with a small opening. Insects have compound eyes that generally consist of thousands of individual photoreceptor units called amatidia. Shrimp also have compound eyes. Cephalopods and vertebrates have camera eyes, each with a single lens that focuses incoming rays and light sensitive se sensing cells at the back of the eyeball. Cephalopods, from the Greek word meaning head and foot, are mollusks with tentacles growing from their heads. An octopus and a squid are cephalopods. Um, by the way, I should probably add one more to this list, um, and that is limpets, which have a shallow curved um, eye, which allows them to assign directionality to light. In 1977, zoologist Ludfried von Salvini, Salvini Plauen and evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer published a comprehensive review of the distribution of various kinds of eyes in modern animals. The presence of similar eyes in unrelated species, cephalopods and vertebrates, are just one example. Convinced the authors that eyes must have originated independently some 40 to 65 times in the history of life. Now that wasn't expected. Indeed, they argued eyes are so oddly distributed in the various phyla that they cannot be placed into a single phylogenetic tree. Whenever you hear somebody saying nested hierarchy, ask them, does the eye fit in a nested hierarchy? The obvious answer is no. In other words, the distribution of eyes that would seem, to be a pr would seem to be a problem for Darwin's theory that all animals have descended from a common ancestor. Nevertheless, Salvini, Plowen, and Meyer managed to conclude the original purpose of our investigation has been to test the validity of Darwin's assertion that the evolution of the eyes is no stumbling block for his theory of natural selection. As we've seen, Darwin passed this test with flying colors. How you make that conclusion is beyond me, but whatever. Skipping a paragraph, the fossil record, what Darwin's theory needs is not a range of eyes that exist in the present, but a range over the history of life. Not a horizontal slice of time, but a vertical one. If the eyes of early animals started out very imperfect and simple, and eyes in some phyla gradually became more perfect and complex in the course of geological time, that might constitute evidence for Darwin's theory. I would agree with that. But complex eyes were already present in some of the earliest animals. Trilobites are extinct members of the arth arthropod phylum, which includes modern insects and crustaceans, such as shrimp. When trilobites first appeared in the Cambrian explosion, many of them possessed compound eyes that were already of a highly developed type. According to trilobite expert Ricardo Levisetti, some of the recently discovered properties of a trilobite's eye lenses represent an all-time feat of function optimization. An all-time feat. The best eyes are at the bottom. <coughs> what does this signify? Levi said he continues. We are confronted here with a very successful scheme of eye structure. The composite or compound eye made of arrays of separate optical elements, the amatidia pointing in slightly diverging directions and each performing an identical function. That's his ellipses, uh, uh, Wells, by the way. Evidence of the success of such a scheme is widespread experience since the eyes of insects and crustaceans, in fact, of most arthropods, still follow a design closely related to that developed by trilobites. Other Cambrian findings only make matters worse. In 2011, a team of paleontologists reported the discovery in Australia of early Cambrian non-trilobite arthropods with well-developed eyes that are comparable to those of modern dragonflies. 
fossilized have been reported in Cambrian and cephalopods and invertebrates, leading an international team of paleontologists to conclude in 2013. The available fossil record illustrates that the Cambrian explosion spawned the simultaneous birth of the principal invertebrate compound eye and vertebrate cam camera style eyes. That's right, not just the trilobites. The vertebrate eye goes back that far. Moving on, fossil animals provide no more help for Darwin's theory than modern mammals. Yet defenders of evolution still believe that eyes evolved gradually before the Cambrian. In other words, they invoke ghost lineages. Which for you computer nerds are uh, basically vaporware. No evidence, no problem, at least for zombie science. A master control gene, Swiss biologist Walter Gehring and his colleagues reported in 1994 that fruit flies, mice, and humans have a very similar gene involved in eye development. Mutations in the gene called PAC6 resulted in reduced or missing eyes, depending on how bad the mutations were. Noting that PAC6 is also found in worms, squids, birds, and fish, Gehring and his colleagues suggested that PAC6 is a master control gene that initiates eye development throughout the animal kingdom. They also suggested that Salvini, Plowen, and Meyer's conclusion that mouse and fly eyes evolved independently has to be re-examined because of the similarity of their PAC6 genes. Think about that. In 1995, Gehring and so, some other colleagues reported experiments in which they artificially caused a fruit fly's PAC6 gene to be expressed in places outside of the eyes. They were thereby able to induce eyes on the wings, legs, and antennae, depending on where you activated it. These ectopic, or out of place, that ectopic is just Greek for out of place, eyes <coughs> appeared morphologically normal and consisted of groups of fully differentiated amatidia with a complete set of photoreceptor cells though there was no evidence they could, evidence they could transmit images to the brain. Keep that in mind. Just making the eye isn't good enough. You have to get the images somewhere where they'll be processed and used. Gehring and his colleagues also inserted mouse pack 6 into a fruit fly em embryo, activated it outside the normal eye, and thereby induced the formation of ectopic eyes. The eye structures, however, were fruit fly type compound eyes and not mouse type camera eyes. Gehring and his colleagues subsequently reported that squid pack 6 like mouse pack 6 can also induce ectopic eyes in fruit fly embryos, and though again the eyes were fruit fly eyes, not squid eyes. Reciprocally, fruit fly pack 6 can induce ectopic eyes in frog embryos though the eyes are frog eyes rather than fruit fly eyes. They probably don't connect to the brain either. Gehring's claim that PAC6 is a master control gene for the formation of eyes has at least two problems. First is that a fruit fly has five eyes. It's two compound eyes and three simple eyes, called ocelli, in the center of its forehead. PAC6 affects the development of the two compound eyes, but does not affect the ocelli. If PAC6 is a master control gene for eye formation, why isn't it involved in the formation of the fly's simple eyes? So there's one problem there. But the second and more serious problem is that the very experiments used to support the claim that PAC6 is a master control gene actually contradicted. If PAC6 were in control, the fruit fly gene would presumably generate a fruit fly eye, and the mouse gene a mouse eye, and squid gene a squid eye, and so on. In fact, PAC6 is not a master control gene at all. It is just a switch. PAC6 is just one example of a remarkable and widespread phenomenon in embryos. An identical or very similar gene can switch on a developmental pathway in many different kinds of animals, though the resulting structures are determined by the species not the gene. Skipping along, Gehring and uh, Kazuho Ikeo subsequently wrote that the 
occurrence of Pax six in so many phyla is one reason to believe in their common ancestry. But another reason is that a separate origin of eyes in over 40 different phyla is not a c compatible with Darwin's theory. This would have come as news to Salvini, Plowen, and Meyer, who, concluded, who had concluded in 1977 that Darwin's theory passed with flying colors. Well, which is it? Well, obviously, whichever one will not destroy evolution. So whether eyes originated one, over 40 times or once, evolution must not be doubted. Can eyes evolve easily? In 1994, Dan Eric Nielsen and his colleague Suzanne Pelger published some calculations allegedly showing that eyes can evolve quickly and easily. According to Nielsen and Pelger, a camera eye could evolve from a patch of light sensing cells in less than 400,000 years. And here's, I guess, where your uh, uh, presentation is being uh, addressed. Yeah, they, uh, they just touched the main parts of the eye and left out all the important details like the retina. Yeah, yeah. Two years before Nelson and Pelger submitted their article for publication, Richard Dawkins gave a lecture in London arguing that natural selection can produce complex and seemingly improbable features such as eyes by an accumulation of small incremental steps. He devoted about five minutes of his lecture to Nelson's as yet unpublished work. According to Dawkins, Nelson had demonstrated how eyes could evolve in very small steps on his computer. Dawkins continued, Nelson assumed that each step which means each mutation caused only a 1% change in the size of something like, say, the steepness of a cup. He also devised a way of measuring the efficiency of an eye. And uh, skipping over a few things, in, by, in 1995, after Nelson and Pelger's work had appeared in print, Dawkins published a book doubling down on his earlier claim. Nelson and Pelger began with a flat retina atop a flat pigment layer and surmounted by a flat protective transparent layer. They then let their model deform itself at random. Uh, as you'll see, that's not quite true. Constrained only by the requirement that any change must be small and must be an improvement on what went before. If you have a ratchet that can't go backwards, the results were swift and decisive. A trajectory of steadily mounting acuity, sharpness of vision, led unhesitatingly from the flat beginning through a shallow indentation to a steadily deepening cup as the shape of the model eye deformed itself on the computer screen. At least that's what Dawkins said. But Nielsen and Pelger had done nothing of the sort. They started out with a series of eight drawings to represent what they believed had been the course of eye evolution. Their eight published drawings, by the way, were different from the 10 drawings used by Dawkins in his 1991 lecture. Biologically, the drawings were quite unrealistic. First, they were two-dimensional. Second, they ignored all the other changes that would have, have to accompany the deformation of a flat patch. Third, and most significantly, they assumed the steady unidirectional evolution of a light sensing patch into a camera eye without any random variations, delays, or deviations from the predetermined path. And of course, ignoring totally genetic entropy. Nielsen and Pelger concluded that 1,829 steps of 1% are needed for the entire model sequence. Nielsen and Pelger calculated that camera eye could easily evolve in about 364,000 years. Well, yeah, if you keep that ratchet in place, they concluded, it is obvious that the eye was never a real threat to Darwin's theory of evolution. That's probably because it was a theological theory, not a scientific one, but anyway. Uh, so in what sense did Nelson and Pelger create, or Pelger, create a computer model? None at all. A computer model is a program that simulates as realistically as possible something that has happened, might have happened, or might happen in the future. But Nelson and Pelger had done exactly the opposite. Their result came first and their calculations came later. And I don't even think it was a computer model. 
In 2003, mathematician David Berlinski exposed just how meaningless, n meaningless Nielsen and Pelger's calculations were. Berlinski also blasted Richard Dawkins for falsely describing their work as a computer model. And he blasted Nielsen and Pelger for failing to correct Dawkins' false description. Berlinski rightly described the whole affair as a scientific scandal. Nevertheless, Nielsen and Pelger are still cited in biology textbooks and scientific articles as having demonstrated mathematically how eyes evolved. Mark Ridley's 2004 textbook, Evolution, states that Nielsen and Pelger made a computer simulation. See how this works, you go one step at a time and pretty soon you know, the game of telephone can get you some very interesting results, if you, especially if you need them. Um, yes? We just might add here that uh, uh, Nielsen and Pelger have been asked, you know, about if they had a computer program and so on, and uh, their answer was they're working on it. Oh, interesting. Well, you see, it goes from working on it to finish to um, computer proof to mathematical proof. Um, just depends on how much proof you need. Uh, according to Ridley, the Model I then evolved in the computer. A 2008 article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA referred to their work as uh, computer-based modeling. Scientific Reports paper says the same thing and uh, the uh, references are in the book. So some imaginative drawings magically evolved into computer-based modeling that mathematically predicted how supposedly easy it is for eyes to evolve. Isn't zombie science amazing? Now, I want you to keep this in mind when people say that the eye was poorly designed but it kind of got stuck. Because if it's that easy to design, why not redesign it to be well designed? But anyway, a patch of light sensing cells. The scientists mentioned above who argued that eyes evolve easily, assumed the prior existence of light sensing cells. But this assumption actually requires either monumental faith or monumental ignorance about the nature and complexity of a light sensitive patch. In animal eyes, light detection involves a series of chemical reactions called a phototransduction cascade. The first chemical in the cascade is retinol, a form of vitamin A, which changes its shape when light strikes it. The retinol is bound to a complex this protein called an opsin. There are over a thousand different varieties of opsin, which changes shape when the retinal does. The opsin's change of shape then triggers a, a chain of chemical reactions that culminates in the generation of a nerve impulse. In his book Darwin's Black Box, biochemist Michael B. he argued that the human phototransduction cascade is irreducibly complex. According to B. he an irreducibly complex system cannot be the result of natural selection, which kicks in only after the basic function is in place. And that's, that's true for everybody else. Everybody else tr really tries to argue that it's not irreducibly complex. Uh, Walter Gehring and uh, Kazuho Ikeo talk about the prototypical eye, as pointed out by Darwin, cannot be explained by selection because selection can drive evolution only when the eye can function to at least to a small extent. You have to have that light sensitive patch before you can get any of the kind of things that Pelger uh, and uh, Nielsen are talking about. But do we have good reason to believe that random events could start the ball rolling? Behe went on to argue that we have good reason to conclude that they can't. And that an irreducibly complex system, such as the phototransduction cascade, is evidence for intelligent design rather than unguided evolution. Of course, defenders against evolution rejected Behe's argument, but Behe had anticipated that criticism. No one had ever explained in detail, scientific fashion, how mutation and natural selection could build the complex, intricate structures discussed in this book, including the retinal cascade. He wrote. <coughs> Skipping on, there are several attempts that were made to do so afterwards, but the summary that um, 
Wells gives is that all of these were simply speculations based on hypothetical evolutionary trees, imaginary ancestors, and blind faith in the power of mutations. All of them presuppose the prior existence of a protein that in evolved into retinol plus opsin with just a few accidental changes. And where you get that protein is not really specified. Clearly the claim that eyes can evolve easily is not based on empirical science. Bad design. While some defenders of evolution argue that eyes can evolve easily, others claim that the human eye is badly designed, supposedly proving that it would evolve by an unguided process. In the human eye, as in all vertebrate eyes, the light sensing cells point toward the back of the retina. The nerve cells that transmit signals to the brain are between the light sensing cells and the incoming light. By contrast, in the camera of a cephalopod, the light sensing cells point toward the incoming light. I'm going to show you figure 7.1. <coughs> uh, this is uh, direct from, uh, uh, from the book itself. And you'll see they, they have the various ganglion cells that are sending stuff to the brain itself. And then uh, intermediate cells where some processing is done, and then the rods and cones themselves. Um, and finally, the, the Mueller cells, which go through this whole mess and carry light straight through all that stuff. And then, of course, down here, uh, there's the pigmented epithelium and then the blood supply. In 1986, Richard Dawkins offered this withering assessment of vertebrate eyes. Any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point toward the brain, toward, toward the light, with their wires leading backward toward the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light with their wires departing on the side nearest the light. Yet this is exactly what happens in all vertebrate retinas. Each photocell is, in effect, wired in backwards with its wires sticking out on the side nearest the light. The wire has to travel over the surface of the retina to a point where it dives through a hole in the retina, the so-called blind spot, to join the optic nerve. Vertebra vertebrate eyes work pretty well, Dawkins conceded, but it is the principle of the thing that would offend any tidy-minded engineer. Well, at least one of Dawkins' intelligence. Six years later, evolutionary biologist George Williams was even harsher. There would be no blind spot if the vertebrate eye were really intelligently designed, he wrote. In fact, it is stupidly designed, while the retina of a squid is right side up. Kenneth Miller chimes in, Douglas Fituma, Jerry Coyne. This is very popular. But what if we look at the human eye from the perspective of function? What if its supposedly bad design actually enables it to function better? The advantages of the re inverted retina. The two main types of light sensing cells in a ver re vertebrate retina are rods and cones. I won't go into much more detail than that. Both rods and cones require lots of nutrients and vast amounts of energy. In mammals, they have the highest metabolic rate of any tissue in the body. That includes the brain. About three quarters of the blood supply to the eye flows through a dense network of capillaries called the choriocapillaris, which is situated behind the retina. Oxygen and nutrients, including modified vitamin A, are transported from the blood into the choriocapillaries, in the choriocapillaries, to rods and cones by an intermediate layer of specialized cells called retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE. In addition to transporting oxygen and nutrients to the hungry rods and cones, the RPE performs another essential function. Rods and cones contain stacks of discs that are densely packed with light sensing molecules. In the process of detecting light, toxic chemicals are generated that must be removed if the light sensing cells are to continue operating. In 1967, Richard Young showed experimentally that a photoreceptor cell continually renews itself by shedding discs at the end closest to the RPE and replacing them with newly synthesized discs at the other end. The RPE then engulfs and digests the shed discs, neutralizing the toxins. RPE cells can even detach themselves and rove through the neural retina, cleaning up debris. 
If the rods and cones were to face the incoming light, as evolutionists claim they should, the blood-filled choriocapillarius and the RPE would have been in front of the retina, where they would block almost all the light. By contrast, nerve cells are comparatively transparent and they block very little of the incoming light. Because of the high metabolic requirements of rods and cones and their needs to regenerate themselves, the inverted retina is actually much more efficient than the tidy-minded design imagined by evolutionary biologists. The blind spot is not a serious problem, primarily because it's covered over by everything else. <coughs> if you don't study physiology, you don't even know about the blind spot. Most of the research cited above documenting the essential functions of the choriocapillaris and RPE was published before 1986. But Dawkins, Williams, Miller, Futuma, and Quine didn't bother to check the scientific literature. They simply assumed that evolution is true and that they knew how an eye should be designed. This is zombie science at work. Mueller cells, there's even more evidence that the human eye is well designed. Among the specialized cells in the vertebrate retina are Mueller cells, first described in the 19th century. Mueller cells extend all the way through the retina from the inner surface to the rods and cones. Um, in 2007, a team of scientists presented evidence that Mueller cells assume the role of optical fibers and reliably transfer light with low scattering from the retina surface to the photoreceptor cell layer. They basically function uh, as optical uh, fibers. In 2010, two Israeli phys physicists published calculations showing that the fiber optic function of Mueller cells is an effective and biologically convenient way to improve the resolution of the eye. Indeed, they concluded that the vertebrate retina is an optimal structure designed for improving the sharpness of images. Let me read that again. The vertebrate retina is an optimal structure designed for improving the sharpness of images. So much for that tidy-minded engineer. When asked about this, Kenneth Miller still insisted that the retina is badly designed. The shape, orientation, and structure of the Mueller cells help the retina to overcome one of the principal shortcomings of its inside-out wiring, he said. Mueller cells are merely a retrofit, a successful and highly functional adaptation made necessary by the original architecture of the retina, but a retrofit. So we're supposed to believe that evolution left us with a flawed retina, then provided it with a retrofit to correct the flaw. And we're supposed to ignore powerful evidence that the inverted retina provides crucial advantages. There is a vision problem here, but it isn't the one evolutions are talking about. A textbook case of myopia. The 2014 Raven and Johnson biology textbook ignores the evidence described above and informs its readers that because natural selection can only work on the variations present in a population, it should not be surprising that some organisms do not appear perfectly adapted to their environment. It then regurgitates the usual claim, including the eye. The eyes of cephalopods are more optimally designed. Now think about it. If it only takes a million years to develop an eye, a quarter of a million years, in fact, a third of a million, whatever, um, why shouldn't you just develop better eyes next time? But whatever. But are they? The textbook like George uh, Williams and Kenneth Miller provide no evidence that cephalopod design eyes are more optimally designed. As long ago as 1984, however, a team of Italian biologists had pointed out that cephalopod eyes are physiologically inferior to vertebrate eyes. They're not better. In vertebrate eyes, the initial processing of visual images occurs in the retina by nerve cells adjacent to the photoreceptor cells. So it's all nicely contained in rapid uh, reaction time. In cephalopod eyes, nerve impulses from the photoreceptor cells must travel all the way to the brain to be processed. They get the same processing, but it's later, and it means that there's more noise. According to the Italian biologist, cephalopods must therefore transfer visual information through fibers with the drawback of being long and noisy channels. The result is slower processing and fuzzier signals. 
What if the nerve cells that process images were directly behind the photoreceptor cells in, in a cephalopod eye? Because the photoreceptors cannot be moved closer to the lens without producing out of focus images, the eye would then have to have been considerably larger. You'd have to have that same layer only to be plastered on the back of the eye. Um, as two European biologists pointed out in 2009, the inverted retina provides a space saving advantage. The vertebrate retina has thus to be considered superior instead of inferior to a cephalopod retina. Nice tidy minded engineers, huh? Yet the evolutionary story continues to be told, and they talk about Nathan, or he talks about Nathan Lentz. According to Lentz, there are no working hypotheses about why the vertebrate retina is wired in backwards. It seems to have been a random development that then stuck because of correction of the magnitude would be very difficult to pull out with random mutations. But it takes less than half a million years to make a new eye. Oh well. This story is completely and demonstrably false but apparently it's just too good to give up. Like many other stories we've encountered in this book, it is a product of zombie science. Now, my own take on all of this, a uh, short take, as we've talked about all of these things in uh, some depth earlier, the eye is a rich source of material for argument about intelligent design. Darwin has already been quoted. Simpson, in the Problem of Plan and Purpose in Nature in Scientific Monthly, and you can get this online if you want, um, says a, telefo a telescope, a telephone, or a typewriter is a complex mechanism serving a particular function. Obviously its manufacturer had a purpose in mind and the machine was designed and built in order to serve that purpose. An eye, an ear, or a hand is also a complex mechanism serving a particular function. It too looks as if it had been made for a purpose. He goes on to say explaining that apparent purpose is a major part of uh, philosoph uh, biological philosophy. Now think about this. What if the explanation is it does serve a purpose and that's why it looks like it serves a purpose. But anyway, argument that eyes can be found in varying degrees, uh, uh, arguments, the arguments there's several arguments that can be made. The argument that eyes can be found in varying degrees of perfection. As Wells pointed out, we do need a geological series in order to make that argument stick. And we don't have arguments that eyes evolved multiple times. Arguments that one gene controls all eye development and raises the interesting question of how do you keep PAC6 alive while the organism is blind? what is the pressure to keep that particular protein good in the presumed uh, ancestor of cephalopods, um, vertebrates, and uh, trilobites without an eye to, for it to uh, work on. Arguments that eyes can evolve easily, which are interesting arguments. Argument, there's the argument that light sensing cells are complex and there's the argument that the iris are wired backwards. Now, it seems to me that intelligent design advocates have the advantage on all counts, except for probably the blind spot. Although the blind spot is so minimal that like I say, unless somebody tells you about it and shows you how to experimentally show it, you don't even know it exists. It's that small. It takes chutzpah to say that I could design a better eye than the vertebrate eye. It really does. Think about what you're saying. It, goes, it takes special chutzpah to claim that in, that in spite of the evidence that we have, theology and not science is driving this argument. You don't want there to be any outside intelligence that could interfere. If one concedes that the vertebrate eye is better adapted to high light levels, then an interesting question arises from an evolutionary perspective. Why did an animal with vertebrate eyes crawl out of the water rather than one with cephalopod eyes? Because think about it, the advantages of the vertebrate eye are most obvious in high light uh, situations. 
And so there's no reason for fish to be the first to come out of the water if that's the case. Should have been the better adapted eye, the cephalopod eye. But anyway, were the vertebrates pre-adapted with eyes made to function better once they enter entered a highlight environment? Or maybe is this whole argument a misleading talking point? Now, I think this chapter gives a good illustration of what Wells called zombie science. The evidence is against the arguments of advocates of unguided evolution. The arguments persist in, s in the indoctrination literature, textbooks, popular presentations and stuff, in spite of their flaws and without qualification. The problem is not so much the quality of the arguments, although that is a problem, but it's their disingenuous nature. They really know better than that. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, we have a comment over here. I may be the only person in this room old enough to remember the Second World War. Pardon me, Ariel's here too. <laughs> um, one of the things that struck me as a kid, I, I was uh, in, I wasn't quite a teenager at the time, but uh, <clears throat> we had something called air raid practice, in which uh, the siren would go off, and you had to eliminate every speck of light coming out of your house or property. Or you, the inspector would drop by and give you a summons to go pay a fine. The question was why? Why a little bit of a light leak here and there? It was during the Second World War that it was demonstrated that a human eye on a very, very clear night could detect light from a single match lit five miles away. To take that further, the efficiency of light detection in the retina is such that there is a response, an electrophysiologic response, to a single photon. That's sort of that, but one that will actually get to the brain. Uh, I'll go a little further. Uh, the, that kind of response is local, but the way impulses are collected in the retina, it typically takes about three photons with a limited uh, time range of time difference in arrival uh, to establish a visible, perceivable response. Now that's designed so near its theoretical limit it's interesting that uh, those who claim the cephalopod eye is superior haven't considered this because it's well documented in the literature for decades. This was a discussion that uh, I enjoyed a lot with my students when we were I was teaching undergraduate physiology. They, the eye is simply incredible in the way it's designed. Also, the fact that the detecting cells are so close to the pigmented epithelium prevents the photons from bouncing back off a structure at an angle other than directly perpendicular to the point and is an important part of clarifying detail vision. Uh, so this whole structure, which seems improbable given the kind of, may I say gently, uninformed but preformed uh, biases of what must be good, uh, it's, it's been very, very interesting. And uh, as I said, it was kind of fun to see the kids as we talked about this, they, their, their understanding and appreciation for the design, perhaps that was at its high point. And now that we have the Mueller cells, it gets even more incredible. Exactly. And uh, the DNA of, of this nucleus of Mueller cells is specifically, dare I say, designed um, to be 
a little denser than the rest of the of the cell so that you have the effect of a fiber optic ray which keeps the the light inside the fiber and actually you know near the middle of the fiber and uh, you know neither absorbing nor scattering the light just oh. you, th you think about do we really need Mueller cells in order to survive? Probably not. The overdesign is just incredible. It's like the overdesign of human brains. We don't need in order to reproduce to have the brain size we do. That's certainly true. Of course, there's an extension of what I just said is in the uh, nocturnal organisms the pigmented epithelium in, includes pigments that are light reflective. Which that, is why you shine the flashlight. So, yes, and this I, is why you see the, 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 that's actually light entering the retina being reflected back out. And so it gets but, two passes at the rods. And that increases sensitivity dramatically. So low light frequency dramatically. Yeah. The light. Right, yeah. so you, you get two passes. Yes. It basically but, doubles the efficiency. But their detail vision is compromised because yeah. the light reflected back doesn't necessarily come off perpendicularly to the path, mm -hmm. uh, or I should say in the identical path in which it yeah. entered. But it does give them enough detail vision. Well, if you want to see some fascinating studies, uh, this has been done in detail with barn owls and capturing mice on dark nights. They need almost no light. Yes, and and they can do it, and and their uh, their eyes are improved to our uh, with respect to ours. Yeah, and of course, birds of prey, interestingly, don't have a single fovea like we do. They have two in each eye, one on the axis looking straight ahead, another looking down at the ground. In other words, the fo fovea is up here, so they can see detailed vision for prey at the same time they're seeing uh, the normal kind of detail we, we would expect and uh, they have two fovea pardon me they have two fovea yes one fovea is is up in this part uh, hits the retina that's up because it's coming from the ground yeah and uh, there's been behavior studies watching birds of prey go into a dive so high that we couldn't see detail and capture a single mouse. So, I, I, th I think the argument to, about the uh, RI being a poor design uh, only works if you don't give any further information. And yet it's repeated as I would say, uncritically, in the standard literature. I mean, you, you've taught, you've seen, you've seen the biology textbooks. Comes up every once in a while, right? Of course. Well, there's a simple answer. There's, there's no other answer possible if you're supporting evolution which they do and we've in biology at Andrews used Johnson which is now Raven and Johnson over and over again but we have the opportunity to present these flaws at the same time that we've found is face strengthening not face weakening and so the eyes a perfect case to me the best to argue intellectually for design uh, just a, another insert here uh, it's been probably nearly 15, 20 years. Uh, Michael Behe was invited to Notre Dame, which is just down the street from uh, Andrews. And he had uh, a series of three or four discussions, confrontations with Daniel Dennett, the 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 guru, the intellectual guru of evolutionists. Did they tape any of those? And then they had a, a real 
evolutionary biologist from Harvard. And this uh, Behe's argument from design came up over and over and over again, and he was giving those two fits, according to the audience anyway. But one of the most fascinating things I have ever seen was that uh, after, I think it was the, maybe the third lecture, uh, Dennett and his colleague brought in a video clip, computer generated, in which they had five blocks connected serially together that were vibrating randomly. And then by simply changing the probability of the vibrating in any, any direction at any particular time, the, they had with, I don't know, several hundred iterations, the blocks moving in such a way that one set would move forward and then the other would move forward and, th and they evolved locomotion that way. That was the best argument they brought. And it was, it, those of us who are biased anyway came away thinking, if that's as good as it gets, man, it was, it was amazing. They had no better argument than creating a computer program, which immediately flashed back to what you were just saying. And pardon me, I'm probably talking too much, so. It's okay. Did they record it? Uh, yeah, did they record the, the, the Behe Dennett uh, stuff at? Uh, I believe they did. I don't know if it's still available. It, pardon me. <laughs> I believe it was, and I, I think there may still be video available through Notre Dame. Uh, the the school of theology religion sponsored this. Yeah, because almost everything eventually gets on the internet. Yeah. I believe Behe is a Roman Catholic, from what I've heard. Yet when he's in his own camp, they don't always listen. <laughs> I'm not setting up Behe as the best argument, but. Yeah. His irreducible complexity that, still, that's a good one. still remains unchallenged, if yeah. you're fair. I won't make any comments about my expertise or lack thereof in, in the human eye, other than my own experience. And I think experience counts for a little bit. Um, in 2000, around the year 2000, I taught two years at Newbold College. My training is in theology, but I had had enough science classes that they hired me for two years to teach science there, <laughs> including philosophy of science and creation versus evolution. So I had a wonderful two years. I taught physics. That was my favorite topic of all things. And I always mentioned to students about the human eye. That, and same response that uh, Jack Stout has received from students. It, it, it just blows your mind when you think of all these wonders just to the human eye. And I asked them, what color do you think is most perceptible to the human eye when the light level is at its lowest? There have been studies done on color variation and what the human eye can pick up. And they were always baffled. They would debate it. I said, uh, yellow. Yellow is the most detectable color of any in the entire spectrum. Just think about it. Why are school buses yellow? It's very simple. So maybe they can avoid accidents in early dawn or twilight in the evening. Or why do rescue people, especially um, maybe even police officers, at least in England, they were all wearing yellow uh, raincoats, see? And it rained all the time. So this really got the people to think that, yes, uh, the eye is designed even for very low level light. Now, not as good as an owl or, or other bird of prey, but uh, it's very good. Now, on a totally different topic, I had an eye problem right in the middle of my two years teaching there. And uh, I had to drop out of teaching for a while. The problem was that I had a partially detached retina. 
And the way you would describe it is when the detachment begins, it's like pulling a curtain uh, down. Now it's responding, the detachment is responding to gravity. So the detachment actually is um, pulling the retina down. But when I, my brain sees it, uh, it's the very opposite. The uh, curtain is going up because the brain flips around. I still don't understand why. Maybe some of our experts here could explain. Why does the brain flip light around so what you actually see and perceive is the very opposite because the eye is a lens that everything's upside down. Okay. And so I, I learned something, but I have a question. <laughs> Why? How can the brain flip it around? Is that an evidence of design, is my question. Um, it's evidence of design of the brain. Yeah. Okay. The, um, the fact of the matter is that if the brain sees enough things, it eventually will switch it around <coughs> for you. Um, and people have done experiments on this. They've, they've taken and put uh, glasses on people that, that do inversion of the, of the uh, image. And at first, everything looks weird because uh, you know everything looks upside down. Uh, you wait a few days, weeks, months, depending on the person. And pretty soon, they've switched it all around again uh, to where they see things up, right side up again. And then you take off the glasses and all of a sudden they're back to, it, it looks weird, even though it's the way they've been looking for you know, 40, 50 years. Um, and some people are better at this than others. And uh, uh, actually there's a school next to us where people are particularly gifted in that regard. Dental school, where you look at an image and it's inverted one way, but not the other, because it's a mirror. And so they get used to being able to do that. And if you wanna, if you wanna have some fun at a party sometime, have a dentist come along and ask them to sign their name while looking at it in a mirror and watch and they'll just go zip right through it. Whereas if you take one of us and ask us to do it, why it looks weird and we, we struggle to do it. Uh, and we actually probably do better closing our eyes and just signing than looking at the mirror. Uh, because because the, the eye is, is fooling itself. But once you've done it enough, you get to where it is perfectly, perfectly good. The other place where you'll see this, uh, you won't see it anymore because we don't do this. But in the old days when people used to have type, uh, where they'd have to put in actual letters, uh, people got used to figuring out that the B and the D are reversed, for example, uh, the small B and the small D. And so they, got, they get to where they just kind of turn it around uh, automatically uh, everything is turned around, but those two in particular will fool you if you're, if you're not used to it. Um, if you don't have this ability very well, it's probably one of the things that, f that allows you to become dyslexic. Thank you, that explains it very well. And also explains the phenomena I experienced when I worked at Andrews University as a student. I worked in the printing press back in the old days of linotype. And I was a, uh, a typesetter, so I would set the heading, but everything was um, backwards. But I got so I could distinguish B and D very easily. I could find mistakes before it goes to press, not reading a proof copy where it's done right, but I could look at the steel linotype on a pla platter, and I could find mistakes that way. It took practice, but possible. So what we're saying is not only is the eye itself immensely designed, but the whole connection between eye and brain 
and even the nervous connection, how are photons transmitted accurately to the brain. All this had to add up. So. Well, the eye is a very special organ. A lot of people don't realize this, but the eye is actually part of the brain, embryologically. Okay. Mm. Um, we have 12 cranial nerves and then we have a bunch of spinal nerves. All of those are constructed the same way. The eye is the only one that is different. In fact, around the optic nerve, there's actually part of the sheath of the brain that comes out to it. And so what's inside of the eye, the, all that processing stuff that those tidy-minded engineers don't want there, um, that stuff is actually part of the brain pre-processing it before it ever goes down in. <coughs> yes, very, and then there. very true. Well, the the whole thing with the eye is amazing. Incidentally, uh, the what you just mentioned uh, in terms of uh, putting inverting glasses on humans. Uh, in an early student of animal behavior, animal behavior is a relatively new discipline. It's, uh, as a formal, it's less than 50 years old. But very early on, a uh, a European. Uh, doctorate professor, mentor, uh, experimented with his students, his graduate students. And as a graduate student, even then, you, you had no, ch no choice but to say yes. <laughs> so he put inverting glasses on them and then took motion pictures of them attempting to ride a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And you, you feared for the life of the peddler 24 hours later, he does the same thing, and they're, they're writing beautifully. Wow. And as you pointed out, of course, the end of the experiment is to take the glasses off and try to ride the bike, and they go through the same thing. They at first see everything upside down, but 24 hours later, back to normal for most of them. It, there's a lot of individual variability. But that ability, the, the most wondrous thing is the connection of the eye to the brain, frankly. Okay. Uh, uh, when I decide yeah. to take my glasses off and wear my contacts, I have a different prescription for my left eye than my right eye. And it takes my brain about three weeks to readjust so that this eye sees distant and this eye see, sees close up. So then if I keep my contacts in, I'm fine. But if I decide to wear my glasses, then it, it throws that off again. So it's, it's all very malleable. The, and, and it is brain function. That's what my doctor told me. It, it'll take your brain about three weeks to adjust. Another person. We have a comment down here. Ariel. Yeah, referring to your comments about the eye being uh, part of the brain. Uh, one of the criticisms of Nielsen Pelger's model is that they start with this light sensitive patch. Uh, which is already working, yet they say the eye can reproduce so many times. They didn't even include the most important part of the eye in their calculations. But uh, the uh, argument has been presented against it is that they start with a ectoderm uh, structure on the surface, this light sensitive patch, while the vertebrate eye, which they proposed to present, uh, the sensitive patch comes from the mesoderm. And they, so they've missed a whole embryological uh, standard interpretation there in trying to they skip it also. Whereas the rest of the eye is ectoderm. Oh, mesoderm. Well, the, that's. Uh, uh. The, the optic nerve and I think the nerve fibers are, are, are ectoderm. That's right. Because it's the, the, the brain and, and, and the nerves that come out of it, I believe, are, are ectoderm. From the brain comes from the uh, neural canal. Yeah, but that's ectoderm. No, it's mesoderm. 
Well, we'll have to look it up. Well, no. Ac actually, no, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Actually, uh, neurons are ectodermal yeah, in origin. So-called neuroectoderm uh, differentiates during development. Right. The the neural tube folds and as essentially in all neurons and these kinds of things mm -hmm. come from. Yeah. And e if it ectoderm. doesn't fold properly, you can have things like anencephaly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that may be the case, uh, but still, it's. But that's it's just, that's interesting that they're. Apparently, mesoderm for the retina itself, no. and then, or, or at least the the retina layer there. Uh, the argument is from the uh, positional state point that they start with a superficial argument, while the vertebrate eye starts from a deeper source uh, for the for the retina. In other words, Nelson Pelletier starts starts with a, a skin superficial skin structure while uh, it comes from the neural system mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier. Uh, the retina comes from inside, not from the skin. Interesting. And how you get them all to carefully integrate with each other so that you get the incredible system that you've got now. And, and the idea that this, well, it only takes less than a million years. I've, I've just personally experienced some of the things we've been talking about all the time. Because uh, I, have an artificial, I have an artificial lens in my right eye and getting glasses, so I've got a normal left eye, getting glasses that would work for both was kind of complicated. And uh, they had to do it like three times. And then still, when I looked through the top part of the glasses, when I first got them, I'd see a double image because the brain had not adapted to, to do its magic with that part of my visual field. Two months later, I see a single image when I look through the top. Except when I do this, I see double images. <laughs> <laughs> Through the, only the, when I'm looking up the top. So, uh, yeah, the brain adapts to, somehow it knows what the most important and clearest re image response is and adjusts to that. And so it's done opposite things when I look through here it, because the glasses it, weren't it perfect. It takes a smaller image and then a larger image and manages to fuse them <laughs> and, and, and call that normal. Exactly. And then, of course, once you take your glasses off, or your glasses off then oh. it suddenly is caught by, oh, wait a minute, they're the same size now or something. Uh, since we're discussing uh, personal eye problems, <laughs> I might mention about uh, three or four months ago, I uh, all of a sudden noticed with my left eye that I had uh, what they call monocular diplopia, and that uh, I, I had double structure. And uh, when checked, well, they couldn't figure out what it was. They thought maybe, well, uh, Something, something uh, serious had gone wrong. Went to a specialist. He thought, "No, uh, ask him to fix it optically." Well, uh, nothing was done uh, for a while while we were waiting for changes, and the eye corrected itself, and uh, I got back to a very slight uh, diplopia. Things were just instead of being two or three. Uh, lines being two or three millimeters apart, uh, excuse that millimeter, it's the way it looked to me like. Uh, they were only about half a millimeter apart, and uh, I got glasses to correct for that later on. But it adjusted itself back in about three or four weeks. Now, remember this, the most important part of the eye is actually back here. And that's uh, a little weird for us to think about, but it's actually true. Um, and one, uh, one 
hint of how important that is is that you can take kittens and you can sew their eyes shut so that they won't open and if you take out the stitches at a certain point I'm not sure exactly how far along but I think it's like about four three four weeks uh, and it, it and it can be and, a little faster than that as well but that's about right yeah and then uh, you take out the stitches and their eyes are perfectly fine they can't see and as and far they, as I know they never can see they never can see because there's a, there's a critical period during which nor <laughs> pardon me I, I'm so used to lecturing without this it's natural <laughs> not to anyway uh, there's a critical period where this happens and it's just uh, that they wind up being blind, you know, totally blind, totally and, and, responseless to light. And to take this a little further in terms of magic, if you then take those kittens at, say, six months, they're still blind. But if you go into the, uh, the visual part of the cortex, which is back here, you now find neurons in the visual cortex responding to sound. Yeah, in other words, the brain is taking, taking advantage of unused space and then perfecting other senses by growing new neurons into that part of the brain. Now, how does the brain know all this? I don't know, but there's another thing that's even more important. Now, think about this. The same thing is true of people. It's more like six years, but if you do not correct sight by six years, let's say you have really dense cataracts, can't see anything, uh, you fix the cataracts at six years old, it's too late. The yeah. brain is already done, qu just quit even trying. But now, if that develops as an adult, cataract obscured, the, then, then you take it off, they're fine. Take it off, things are normal. But, but this is important because you remember the man who was born blind. He says, Good point. you remember in the middle of his argument, he says, never in the history of the world has this happened. Now, I don't know. I can't actually prove that, but I imagine that he had more than the usual interest in finding this out. <laughs> and it had not ever been reported to his knowledge, and it hasn't to mine either. You're six years old and you don't see, it's too late. What that means is that in a way, the man born blind being able to see was more impressive than Lazarus being raised. If I were God and I had this supercomputer that stored all this stuff, you know, I could raise Lazarus from the dead. I would go back to, you know, maybe three minutes before he died, go through his blood, pick out all the bacteria or whatever it was that killed him. And um, it's probably bacteria because it was only a two day illness and he, and he died. But whatever, you know. And, and you know, switch things around a little bit and, uh, and, you know, put it according to my general design and I could get Lazarus back. I could not do that to the man born blind. I'd have to totally rewire everything. And I have no clue as to how to do it. And furthermore, I'd have to do it without changing his personality. Because he had a chance to step out of his personality if he'd wanted to. Remember? He's walking along and, hey, isn't that the guy who's born blind? Um, yeah, that's him, all right. Nah, but he sure looks like him. And he says, I'm the man. He knew that he used to be blind. It didn't mess up his uh, cognitive structure or his memory or identification structure or anything like that. He was able to say, yes, that was me. I was blind. I can now see. And he maybe wouldn't have quite the same way of explaining it as I would because of my knowledge of physiology. But he knew that this just does not happen. If, it, if this man were not of God, 
he could not do anything. Yes. The fish in uh, Hawaii underground wander into the caves and within six weeks they're totally blind. Yes, the functions, they, 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 no, well, the, the, um, the genes are turned off. That's why an uh, ugly um, um, caterpillar becomes a beautiful butterfly. It's, it's different genes turned off, different genes turned on, and things do happen. Uh, Dale Bradison, uh, big um, uh, gentleman in uh, UCLA, he is into reversing early Alzheimer's, and there's tremendous stories. He talks about a lady who fell, young lady, backward, and uh, she, I do not know at what level of her vertebrae that they had to do surgery, but when the surgeons were doing it, she came out blind. She couldn't see anymore. 23 years. And uh, one day she's, whatever, she learned how to do things as being blind. And uh, she fell backward again, and they had to go in surgery. She came out. 23 years later, she's perfectly seeing. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That's all I can say. You know, how do these things happen? How do these things happen? And, uh, no, I mean, he, he's right here, uh, they fixed UCLA. The second time that they had messed up. They messed up, right, right. And <laughs> this is not hearsay or tale, tale. You know, this is real stuff that, uh, and he's an authority all over. Right? And you yeah. can Google and you can find that name, Dale Bradison. And he tells that story. Um, I'm not sure if he's a believer. He's talking about what can be done. Um, Apoi a little, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, one that uh, people have, some people have uh, uh, that causes um, Alzheimer's, for example, the, the gene. Uh, yeah, but he says, we might have the gene, doesn't matter, but if our lifestyle is the right way, uh, we can reverse um, uh, this process. Uh, that goes on, and of course, as you know, he's saying that the ones who are alive now, uh, 320 million uh, folk, uh, adults in this country, uh, at least 45 million are gonna be coming down with um, Alzheimer's in their lifetime. That, that's a subject for a whole different day. <laughs> no, I know, but it's in my, what I'm going at, uh, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's all I can say. There are things that happen that we, we don't understand. Yeah. Oh, the, that's all. Anybody, you know, I, I'm reminded of when I was in medical school and this guy came down to teach us em embryology or neuro neuroanatomy and uh, neuroembryology is what it was. And, and he said, we don't really understand what's going on. We are like natives looking at a, a radio and we, open it up and look at the back side and we pull out a transistor and the radio suddenly goes hum and you say aha that must be the anti-hum transistor <laughs> <laughs> we, we really have very little clue as to what's going on and it, it, it amazes me, all these people who could design the eye better. And what really blows my mind is that these folk, uh, Keith Miller or whoever else, the names are, they're putting these things as, as dogma, as fact, and they're destroying the lives of young, millions of young people yeah. all over the world. Yeah. That blows my mind. It's so sad. Yeah. How will they stand on that great judgment mm -hmm. day? Come back in two weeks. We're gonna we're gonna deal with some of that. Anyway, come back next week, and we'll be talking. I'm always here. We'll be talking about antibiotic resistance yes, and cancer. Here.